Hello and welcome to another episode of the Eat Weeds podcast. I'm Robin Harford and today I'm here with the fabulous Seed Sisters who are... Karen Lawton and Fiona Heckles. Hello. 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 <laughs> so we've already had a podcast with you. We did. Didn't we? A long time ago. We can't fun. actually remember how many years. So... The reason I've got you on is that I'm curious that your work, it seems to have moved on from kind of doing product, herbal product, into education. So just really take us through your journey, because you've just released a book called The Sensory Herbal Handbook, which is fantastic in that I love that it incorporates what the word I use is sensory-based practices for meeting plants. So let's start with the history and how you end up producing a book now. Okay. So Fiona and I met at Middlesex University studying a herbal medicine degree. And we soon realised how much fun creating remedies was. So we'd go out and make up various different formulations. And one of those formulations was a balm. It was a balm that was made up of comfrey oil, comfrey leaf oil, horse radish root oil and heather flowers oil, which we mixed with peppermint and rosemary essential oils, and we called it Achies. And on our travels around festivals and markets and various different places where we had our stall, we were getting incredible feedback from people, including there was this wonderful gentleman who he couldn't walk His knees had seized so badly and he said on applying that and massaging his knees he was slowly able to start moving again and we had various different um, reports like this and we thought we can't we we need to put it out there we need to get this balm out in every osteopaths and chiropractitioners and just put it out there a bit more so what happened why why did it why did you stop Well, we had lots of different products that we were creating and we were working on this principle that the first rule of pharmacy from sort of ancient Persian Avicenna times was to make medicine beautiful. So we know that we get all those beautiful Victorian medicine bottles that you can find in the old rubbish dumps and these days much of pharmaceutical medicine is in white boxes, plastic casing, brown bottles. And we really wanted to entertain the idea that part of medicine is feeling good about what you're taking, making it taste good, making it look beautiful, making it smell good. So that's how we set about creating all of these different formulations. And at the heart of it was the idea that Maybe just one drop of a potion could be enough to create a catalyst within someone to connect them with nature and with the plants that are within it. And we set about going round different market stalls, different events, giving people these medicines, just one drop at a time, talking to them about what was going on with them. And maybe they'd take a bottle home, uh, they'd get back in touch with us. And one of those products was this amazing Achies balm. And out of the blue, one year, probably around 2006, 2009 maybe, 10 10 or so years ago, we got a phone call on the summer solstice to say um, where from the Medical Regulatory Council... um, investigatory body and we've got a dossier on the work that you've been doing and we'd like to have a meeting with you um could you meet us at this place at this time and that place was an office block (laughs) so that was the first thing the phone call the phone call was followed up by a document and it arrived at my address because our business was Uh, registered at the address and it was a huge weighty pile of papers it was 30 or 40 page document that had photographs of all of our products they had just gone into depth at properly studying us and they knew every single herb that was in everything we were doing and at that time 
it was very much in the in the media or around people I was with this whole free man thing. Yeah. Um, and because I was like, what are we doing with this? This is a legal. Yeah, yeah. This is a legal document. So I wrote back saying I do not understand what this is about because I just thought they can't. That's what I'd read. You, they can't um, process you further or go any further. So I thought we'll start by going. We don't get what you're talking about. What what they were talking about was something that was actually put in place in 2004, which was the EU Directive on Herbal Medicines. Which was passed on Halloween night. Which was passed on Halloween night. We had the phone call on the summer solstice day. But what they actually did, it must have been around 2010 that they called us because they they left that dormant, that legislation, for quite a few years until they started chasing people up about it. So herbalists were doing the work that they'd always done, which was having market stalls, creating remedies from garden fair, um, educating people about plant medicine, getting out there. Um, and then suddenly this phone call was about you're not allowed to sell medicine that you create under the traditional herbal medicines directive so the long and the short of it was we ended up on a roundabout in a trade trading standards building in Hertfordshire this huge multi-story building built on a roundabout and on we it was mad. We got there, and in the reception, there was a dying cheese plant. There was, there was huge, beautiful plants that were just wilting and dying. And there was a there was a watering can that had all of the artwork from the canal boats, like beautiful roses painted on it. it was sitting on the desk at the front. And we were like, shall we water your plants for you? They're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Cleaning the leaves. And she was like, oh, that's um, Bill's job. That's not my job. <laughs> that's not my job. And we were like, but you're the person that's got to sit and look at them all day. Like, do you want us to do it for you? And she was like, no, no, leave those, leave not those. Job. So we were like, right, OK. And then and they led us to oh. the 50 millionth floor where there was no windows. And they put us in the... No, it was mad. There was a huge room full of people. And there desks. was... Desks. <laughs> there, there was desks. Faceless desks. There was nothing on the desks. And it was... Hot, not hot box, what do they call it? Hot stop? Every hot. 20 minutes the buzzer went and people got up and moved desks because it was a new bit of information Whoa, from America. That's really... Increased productivity, <laughs> movement to <laughs> the <laughs> office. We're like, where are we? Yeah, and we got, surreal. Oh, it was so surreal. And we then, got led into a little room by these two people who were talking to us about the future of our work and what we weren't and were allowed to do in their eyes. And these two people had such little knowledge about herbal medicine. That they told us we are not allowed to keep making the St John's wort lip balm. But we can make a Hypericum lip balm. Because they had no (laughs) idea that St John's wort and Hypericum were in fact the same herb. Fiona and I had a fucking row. We had a massive row. (laughs) And, And all we... We, would, we nearly walked out, we nearly stormed out because it was so ridiculous and we had to really keep our cool. And I remember just fantasising about stamping on all the cars in the car park and taking <laughs> we a crap living. in the middle of the car Like, I just... There was just something welling up inside us. We, we, were like, we were being told by these people that the business that we'd created, this market stall travelling herbalist business of lovely remedies. After doing a four-year full-time Bachelor of Science degree in medical herbalism... Was actually not not legal or didn't fall within the framework of our society. We were being told we weren't allowed to do what we were doing. (laughs) It made us really cross. (laughs) So, but it was very funny because they ended the interview and the gentleman from the MR... C? MRC, Mr. C, yeah. He um, was of Indian descent, and at the end he said, Oh, do you know anything good for psoriasis? Because you're herbalist. <laughs> it was really <laughs> bizarre. And so he was just saying, you know, it was one of those jobs where this is my job, I sympathise with you, but you're not allowed to do it, and if you don't desist, it carries a prison sentence. So 
And we'd always thought that, you know, oh, but prison one... can prison can kind of raise the profile of your cause and um <laughs> <laughs> We'd all sort of had that attitude. Well, yeah, that... sure, it can. <laughs> <laughs> but like, we I don't know whether that's the best route. <laughs> like, we worked out then it wasn't the best In that route. moment, we were like, oh, yeah, we've got little kids and... Um, we don't want to go to prison. We don't want to go But to they prison. gave us another option, and this was the option that they were driving us towards. They said, why don't you invest £90,000 per product and we'll take it for three years of testing so that it can become pharmacologically categorised so yeah. it's safe for the general public. So get basically um, paying for a process of getting a, a dossier on your each product to get a licence for it, which then costs a further... Well, actually, we had to go and research the overall cost of it, which we found out was then a further 15 grand just to keep that product licensed per, per year. And, and includes animal testing as part of that, which is something that Fee and I don't really want to fund. Well, all we wanted to do was connect people to nature. So the idea that you'd then take compounds from the herbs, put them in a laboratory setting, test yeah. on animals, blah, blah, blah. We were like, that. that's not... So we decided after a six-month yoga pose... Well, yeah, like... it was like we were doing loads of yoga at the time and it was that thing of like... Um, don't don't react like how how can we not react to this because you know that that sense that we had of feeling angry and the injustice of it and impotent feeling impotent at yeah. this for for many years the pharma the pharmacy the pharmacological agro petrol war machine <laughs> well yeah. that's who they are Arms trade they, they haven't been you know, we call them Satan. They're like the baddies. <laughs> and they wanted to crush us, basically. So it was yeah. like, how, what do you do with that? And we decided that what we do with that... So we is... inhaled for six months, didn't we? <laughs> Just breathing very, very slowly. And then we were like, we need to change this for the positive. And what do we want to do? Do we want to spend our lives fighting there's a cause here there's an important cause which is that people need access to information about herbal medicine people need the ability to connect with nature and to be shown how to do it and that's the most important thing and so there's a fight there but how do we fight without being conflict conflict? yeah how do we fight without conflict yeah and you flow around how do you flow round the boulder rather than in the river, like water, rather than smash through the boulder? Because in our culture, and kind of one of my defaults in the past was like injustice, smash the boulder. Where actually, if you can flow like water around the boulder, the boulder eventually is worn away. I love that. So it's yeah, exactly. And what's the boulder made out of? Some hard stuff. <laughs> so we decided that it would be um, the best focus. Sorry, did you belch then? If I did. Did you enjoy it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I done that on the phone to people before. Did you call some most fennel rude. before we got I did. Here. I ate fennel. Let me get back to my thought process now. <laughs> um, creativity. The yeah, the transmutation of anger into creativity and teaching sharing everything that we know through education sharing and the most important part of the sharing is this self self knowledge that we actually all of us humans understand nature because we are nature so it's finding ways for us to model um, and be inspiring to others and that's a big a big intention of ours we want to impassion people to go and play in the wilds. We didn't have the the medicine bottles anymore, but we had ourselves as a package. So we were like, okay, if we dress up in bright, garish outfits and do crazy stuff with our hair and be gregarious and funny and out there, we'll attract people to us that wouldn't normally be attracted to herbal medicine like what's that you know who who gets into that 
people didn't even know what it was. So we were like, if we just go out there and call ourselves theatre, then people have got a way into it that isn't quite as intimidating or off-putting. Yeah, and that was a major thing. We worked at festivals and we made it um, a rule that we would never be in the healing fields because people that go to the healing fields are seeking healing. So we'd rather be in the craft or the theatre and circus or the stay up all night and munt out fields. So people... But we're a bit younger then. We're going back next year. We are going back next year. Actually, Andy was the year before. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's good. (laughs) Speak for yourself. (laughs) We've never done that, have we? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so it's reaching people that potentially have never ever thought about herbs. And that's what we want to do. We want to reach people and help them to see that just a short walk from everybody's home is the medicine that we need. That's the important bit. And we started teaching, we started leading herb walks. And we, we set up an apprenticeship programme that to start with was just a one-year course that then turned into a three-year course And on that, we developed our own sort of system of herbalism that was very much about following the plants through the seasons and the elements. And we've drawn from all of our learning of Western medical herbalism, Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic stuff that we looked into, um, but created something that was very much about in the springtime you find leaves most prevalent and the the nutritional medicine that the leaves offer linked in with the lymphatic system and the kidneys. So in the element s- of water. Yeah, and that was in the springtime. So that's where we'd, we'd sort of start with people and then go and we, in. Dr- and we dressed up as spring cleaners. We bought blue tabards <laughs> and we got blue fluffy dusters. And, and blue hair nets. <laughs> And blue fake and eyelashes. Blue fake eyelashes and taught our sessions, <laughs> dressed up as blue cleaners. We still do. We still do, yeah. And then in summer, you'll find the fire witches. <laughs> the flamenco passionate women who are working with the flowers and that element of fire. In the summer. And then in the autumn, we move to the harvest time and the seed which we link with the element of air and inspiration and the nervous system. And that's our Seed Sisters costumes with the old seed packet material on them. And that really links in with activists like Vandana Shiva and people that are doing work for seed sovereignty um, because it's a global issue that we all need to start seed saving And seeing it as a political act and growing food and medicine for each little community across the globe. And that's what we did in our grandparents' time. I watched a film, I think it's called Open Sesame. I recommend it Mm. to everyone, it's brilliant. And it was all about how many little seed companies they were. I think it's only in the 70s, hundreds and hundreds of seed companies and then slowly the bigger ones just bought them all up, bought them all up. And I think we're looking... It's changing now because people are realising, but we all know the big bad one that we don't mention their name. We don't oh, give them any shall, power. Shall not be mentioned. <laughs> At that time, it was changing from six massive multinational corporations into just three globally wow. um, that had the power over most of the seeds. I read an article recently that said... Um, even in India, the cotton farmers are taking back power and not buying the the terminator seeds anymore, that they're starting to go back to the old methods of seed saving and being more in control, which, you know, is that is a change from even just a few years back when we were starting to do this work. So it's positive what's happening, but it's had to get into a really crazy state of affairs to come back around it's kind of like a breakdown, breakthrough scenario, isn't mm, it? It's yeah. like it has to all go completely chaotic and, and tits up, and then people kind of feel that it, it's deeply impacting their lives in a really negative way, and they find the solutions. Because it's always, to me, comes from grassroots. Mm-hmm. It's from the bottom up, always. Solutions don't no, never 
come from the top down, mm-hmm. which is what the culture wants us to believe, that you know, if we look to our masters and we look to the authorities, the, reg- the regulatory bodies, that somehow they have our best interests at heart. When they, they do kind of, I know where their intentions come from, but they don't, because like you found, you know, when they interviewed you, they knew nothing about blooming herbal medicine and Hypericum and St. John's were, you know, yes, you can use Hypericum, no, you can't use St. John's were. It's like, you're talking the same thing. Mm. What on earth are you on, <laughs> actually? You know? Is this for and, real? And I think what I love about your work, well, I know about your work, as was found um, last night, so we're actually recording this at the Medicinal Mushroom Conference, put on by Fred Gillum and Natasha, um, I don't know her surname, but his partner, uh, thewildsideoflife.co.uk, if you want to come to next year's one. And, you know, you kind of blew the audience out with your theatrics. And I think that's so accessible in the way that you put the information over. And we talked at lunch about the kind of decolonializing the language. And by that, I mean most of herbal medicines language or botanical language is an elite language. It keeps it in the control of the hierarchy in the way that the apothecaries spoke in Latin so none of the plebs in the past could understand how to use plant medicines. And you're doing a dismantling of that entire kind of construct, which is why I love your work. And Seed Sisters, the sisters bit of the word is spelled S-I-S-T. A S and the A is in a circle, and as we found here, you know there are old people who are asking, well, what's the A A in a circle mean? And younger people, kind of millennial age, kind of going, well, what's that A in a circle mean? But those of us who grew up with punk, we know exactly what it means. It means anarchism, mm. and anarchism is not some chaotic kind of philosophy. Anarchism is about trusting your own inner authority. That actually self-governance, self-governance self-regulation, and self-responsibility. Absolutely. So, your combination of putting forward herbal knowledge in a very, very accessible way through humour, predominantly theatrics, and just your craziness, which is just. <laughs> off on another level compared to most people (laughs) just makes you know you just it's like bees around honey i mean it's just like everyone just comes in and wants to be fed because you feed people Mm -hmm. just as honey does yeah Mm -hmm. and so take us through this before we do because we we were just at autumn okay i just want to say about this resonance that you're talking about deconstructing and going back so the seed that is very prevalent in autumn that we can all gather and save it's then there's this time at winter the silence the dark time the reflective time when all of nature stops and at the moment we are living in a growth economy we're in a growth mindset we're stuck in the spring and summer and the spring and summer and there's no time to reflect and that's something that within the system that we've developed and created together it's the roots the winter the ancestors the bones the bare bones and the earth and this is something that we've tried to apply to our social enterprise as well because you know we've got an accountant and when you talk to people in the you world have an accountant. we have an accountant <laughs> we we're like crazy <laughs> crazy nutters <laughs> Try an account a social enterprise without an accountant. <laughs> we can't <laughs> count. <laughs> but you can count on us. But the, um, you know, it's about um, keeping profit to sustain ourselves and the whole running of a social enterprise. But really, we need another model of business where we don't actually need to sustain in a few months. So for those months of winter, potentially you stop working Mm -hmm. and that's something we've tried to take on in our lives that we finish at the end of November most of our trainings and our work and we try and do family time and spend time stopping and slowing and not churning out more content (laughs) this has been a, a lesson generally we've noticed it in in ill health that convalescence is a thing that's not um 
a, a thing of the past. It's not been a, a trend of recent that once people have been ill, that they actually take downtime to rest and recuperate, which is reflective of that summertime society that we live in. But also within our business, the social enterprise, it, it differs in its focus. Social enterprises were particularly set up not just to be focused on profit, but to be focused on people and the planet. So it's a three-pronged approach to life rather than just being focused on this idea of profit and growth. And growth within our social enterprise has been very much about trying to create stable, steady foundations so that our lives are less chaotic, so that we can manage the day-to-day running of it and still have time to be creative, to create new content, new stuff, the things that we love, and also this downtime with family and for us to connect with each other outside of a work scenario. And it's been a really... um, it it has been a little bit like that cycle for us because after that regulatory council meeting and all of the energy we had to put into getting everything off the ground with all that passion for creating change that was at the heart of it we we almost worked ourselves to the bone we were both we had children with us we'd take them with us wherever we went we were being mothers we were working you know and and We've, we've found much more of a balance now um, within that actually taking our own advice, but we've had to go through that cycle ourselves to a certain degree. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I, th- I think it's, I'm really glad to hear you say convalescing because it's something that, that I teach um, when I talk about stinging nettle and the German abbess Hildegarde Bingen, who wrote about nettle, loved nettle, was a great plants woman, healer, herbalist, blah, blah. And she said, you know, nettle is good for convalescing. And we don't have this. We don't, we don't have it in our culture. It kind of dropped out of the, in the 50s, I would imagine. We had a lady on a course recently, and her father was a London bus driver. And up to the 70s, the London transport network had convalescence homes on the south coast and he was sent there after a heart attack and she was telling us that in the convalescence home they knew about sunlight being good to infuse water with. So they used to put their patients' water jugs in the window to get sunlight. And isn't that beautiful? Yeah. I mean, wouldn't that practice be great in every hospital in the land? Or every big corporation that can afford to have a convalescence home for their workers. I just think it needs... I mean, I'm, I'm, I do really feel that it's fundamental as an mm. aspect of healing to come mm-hmm. back. And I think the bit that really blew my mind when um, in 2004 I stopped basically working because of ill health, drug addiction... Um, <laughs> And I remember walking down the tube station in London and you know how they have the pictures of all what's on in London as you go down the escalator? Well, this one entire wall was taken up with pictures of... And it, the words were, hi-ho, hi-ho. And then at the end, on the bottom, was a bottle of pills, it's off to work, we go. And it was about, you get flu, you get ill, neck our pills, you can still keep working. And it was just... It, I just laughed. Mm. I mean, I thought, what, first off, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> it was like some comic kind of anti drug pharmaceutical thing. <laughs> Until it, you know, penny dropped being slightly slow on the uptake and realised that it was actually being really serious. Mm. And, and yet, without convalescence, it's like, it's vital to our well being. That's why we're living in a burnt out society. That's why we're living with people who are chronic fatigued, complete adrenal depletion. People living on caffeine. How many cups of coffee do people have a day just to get through the day? And as clinical herbalists in our practices, that's something that, you know, what can you do? You see people that are obviously burnt out. They obviously need to quit their job and go to sleep for a couple of months. And how can you say that to people when they've got mortgage payments to make? How... Yeah. It, it's very frustrating, the current societal model of working people to death. Is, I mean, um, that's, I think that's one of the main drives, really, for us as well, is this idea of 
inspiring and educating people to chill out, <laughs> connect with plants, um, and and be inspired and take responsibility for their own health care. We we're in a situation where if if you can go to a doctor with something like a sore throat, possibly even walking past a sage plant on the way, take up a GP's precious time under the state of the NHS and not have to take that responsibility, you're less likely to do the prophylactic looking after yourself before the sore throat kicks in. And for us, even simple remedies within the home that create more awareness around you're going to have to work hard to look after yourself if you get sick, so let's look after ourselves from the beginning. Just that mentality shift could create great change with this self-responsibility could take pressure off the NHS, could help to support a new system of medicine. And that's what writing the book, the Sensory Herbal Handbook, was all about being able to get this out there to as many people as possible, people that maybe didn't have the time to come for a year's apprenticeship with us or or the finance to do it. But here's something they can dip into. It's with practical recipes, takes you through those seasons that we've just talked about. There's food, tonics, nutrition in there. Just trying to cover as many accessible bases as possible for people. And the beginning of the book is trying to set out very clearly our techniques, these sensory techniques, and to demystify herbal medicine because so many people who are interested in studying herbal medicine are put off because they think it will be too scientific for them. Because you open a herbal and you'll see the herb's name, the Latin name, then there'll be actions and there's a list of long Latin and Greek words and then you'll have constituents with you know, words like flavonoids and tannins and polyphenols might be completely new so what we've tried to do is explain how when you smell something how you can translate that smell when we walk past our lavender bushes and you pinch your lavender and you take a scent you're smelling essential or volatile oils all of the essential or volatile oils in the lavender or your rosemary or your thyme or your sage have some antimicrobial action that means that they help to in some ways an antibacterial an antiviral or an antifungal agent they're protective and that's what the plants have developed those oils for to protect themselves against pathogens and simply by smelling this we know so it's one of the languages of the plants. And then we've also looked at taste. So the most people can connect in with the idea of a bitter taste. And it's certainly something we used to have in our diet a lot more when we were uh, foraging leaves for salad, um, just as a day-to-day activity, eating a lot more of the bitter lettuces, which have come back into fashion over recent years. But this idea that a bitter taste stimulates the gastric juices it stimulates saliva it almost readies your body to eat and so if you taste something that's bitter within a herb you can relate that to its digestive action how specific it is for the digestive system and in what areas depends on which herb it is but there's generalizations we can make from the scents from the tastes and from the the feeling that's created within the mouth. So if there's, if it makes your saliva frothy, it's indicating that there's saponins in there, these soapy compounds that help to expectorate from the lungs, so to bring up phlegm. So there's lots of different clues within the plants that help to build up an understanding of the language of the plants and how they relate to us on a physical level, but also on a more emotional level spiritual level as well and another of our techniques is botanical drawing and by that we don't mean being a wonderful artist and creating a piece of exquisite work we just are asking people to take the time to go and sit 
with a pen and paper or your pencils with a plant and draw it because when you draw something you take acute notice and you're observing all of those details and then you will never mistakenly ID that plant again you'll know it you know the shape whether it's got little hairs on it and drawing a plant is a beautiful thing and we've seen that year in year out people come on the course and have a mantra a lot of people have a mantra of I can't draw I can't draw and that's because someone in their early life has told them they can't draw and I think that's that's really important from one of the ethos of, of punk of the punk movement was to break out of the constructs that we'd all been told family social cultural and it was if you wanted to start a band well I can't play a guitar well pick a bloody guitar up then and start strumming and see what happens and over time it w- you will make a better noise than when the first time you pick up the guitar. It may still have sounded pretty <laughs> horrific, but then you got the other members of the band who've never written poetry but have got a poet inside them and write. And it was like, anything's possible, no permission required, we'll just do it. So if you do want to paint, paint plants, you're not going to have to post it on Instagram to make it perfect. You just get up and you quietly draw it yourself and it's just for you. It's like journal writing. It's just for you. It's not for public consumption. The fact that you might end up as a fantastic botanical artist that you <laughs> never realised was kind of hiding away inside you is a second. But the chances are you won't become a fantastic botanical artist and it doesn't matter. The point is to do and engage and work with plants and drawing is a fantastic way to really get to know and understand a plant like you say. I mean, within within the scope of the book, obviously, um, you're not going to be expected to perform or um, show your work. Um, but we do um, put in there characterizations of the plants and poetry that links in with some of the more creative work that we do do with groups uh, when we have our apprenticeship. So we do expect people that come on the course through unlocking this creativity they work with a plant throughout the year and at the end of the year they create a a performance or a a piece of work that might be a piece of music, it might be a piece of poetry, it might be some performance art, something that reflects them and their connection with the plant. Because the herbal medicine knowledge of the past was always passed down through this performance or oral tradition and there was this sense of wonderment and connection with the plants through that work and because we want to proliferate knowledge helping people to unlock their creativity then helps them to pass on what they've learned in a personal way about the plants yeah Okay, so to qualify that, that, that's a whole year course that, that people, unknown people have come together and have developed a deep bond yeah. over the course of the year. So it's perfectly okay that you can't draw or mm-hmm. dance or perform, but you'll do it anyway because you've got the, the safety and the trust there. What I was referring to more was that just start doing it, whoever's listening to this. You don't need anyone's permission. Absolutely. You just go and find a plant that you just get naturally drawn to and you get a piece of paper and yeah. you get a pencil. It doesn't even have to be coloured crayons and you just spend time. It's it's you time, mm-hmm. actually. It's you time for you and the plant and and draw it in whatever way, however stick man like it is. I always draw stick people because um, <laughs> I'm not a bloody artist. But I don't really care. It's, that's not the point. The point is to train our observation and our eyes and our awareness to pay deep attention to a plant Mm -hmm. and get to know it that way and that's one of the primary um, that's the beginning for us with within sensory herbalism the observation you you key in you you sort out your observation skills your sensory perceptions the taste the feel the smell and then there's all of the the stuff that you read in books you know then you've got the information because you've already intuited for yourself what this plant is doing how it's making you respond and then you can read about it and 
more often than not, you already know what that plant has been documented to do. And that's something that has happened to Fiona and I countless times. We've been out working with a plant that isn't particularly one that we've studied, known, trained with, or is in fashion. And you get a feeling, you end up talking about certain things. You notice that this plant is particularly bright and red and attractive. I mean, we've been talking about the fly agarret mushroom here. And this mushroom, this toadstool, has attracted us to it, as it has many, many people. And it's, it feels like it's calling, it's saying, look at me. What, what am I for? Why am I here? Come and interact with me. And it's been part of human culture. We've heard on this wonderful medicinal mushroom conference that the muscarinic compounds, that the fly agarret predates the, the magic mushrooms, the liberty caps. We heard that just now. And it's, a, it's super ancient. I don't even remember how many. Is it two billion years, Fred yes. was saying? Mm. It's like super old. And... All our ancestors and prehistoric man were just knew they were part of nature. We, we are part of nature and we need to reclaim that so that we can live in a much healthier way. Yeah, all, these, all this work is about learning to trust your intuition as well. And we always say, you know, you can go and sit in a field with a plant for a day and have a lovely experience drawing it. If you know it and you know it's safe to taste it or smell it, um, to f- feel into that. If you're meditating with it, what thoughts come to your mind? Or if you're with someone else, what do you end up talking about? And that's all lovely, but what are you going to do with all that information to turn it into something useful for yourself or to work with others and that's where that interpretation comes into it backing up what you felt with all that information that other people have written and thinking I already knew that learning to trust yourself and then actually having something to go out and work with in the world and on yourself and it's back to that self-responsibility and trust in yourself and once you start getting those trust those keys to the creativity in whatever way you want to flow get unlocked and it just we've seen some life-changing stuff from people connecting in with plants and nature it was a lady that um came up to us last weekend and she she was lovely she said i've just bought your book and i just want to confess to you (laughs) i I took your book out and i sat in the field and i sat with daisy the little common grass plant daisy Bellis Perennis, and she said, I felt so scared to put it in my mouth. It said that you could eat it in your book, and I was there thinking, what if I'm mistaking it for something else? What if what could happen? And she said she felt this incredible, irrational fear of eating the daisy. What could happen? And then when she ate it, she said she felt elated. She felt that there was something that really shifted in her being able to trust And she was laughing at herself that she'd had that fear. But it is a common fear. There's so many people that are scared to ingest plants that, um, you know, we've been working with them for years, so we've got a certain amount of knowledge. And we can sometimes assume that other people know. I I mean, it, it really takes me by surprise sometimes. I did a herb walk recently and people couldn't see the difference between a cow parsley and an elder tree there was a couple of people that really couldn't see the difference between fine um feathery leaves and a more i want to say a plum shaped leaf you know they couldn't see it they just saw green and i realized that my assumption that people could see things the way i see things is a disability of mine and that it's really important for us to deconstruct and demystify and just go back to assuming no knowledge. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's... I mean, the stuff you're describing is, to me, what what people refer to as plant blindness. Yeah. I mean, and mm. it really is. I mean, yeah. you know, and one of the things I find really hard as a, as a so-called teacher um, is I have to get back to beginner's mind yeah. in order to be able to teach properly. Yeah. Because... We've all got, you know, 
we were on a timeline. We started whenever we started and we found ourselves where we are. And over that timeline, we've accumulated knowledge, you know, information. Um, and actually to communicate that information in a way to someone who doesn't have, have, have that same understanding because they haven't necessarily started down the green path um, is is a really important way, and I think you know everyone I've met that knows you knows that you just communicate it in in really simple, extraordinary ways. I mean, it, it's a really rare quality. Uh, so anyone who is listening and you want to learn or take your work further, then you can't go much further than the Seed Sisters Century Herbal Handbook as a start. And then if you want to go deeper, then obviously there's all your courses and everything else. But the fact that you come from the sensory-based process is, is really vital because there's not much of, this, of it out there. There's a few of us teaching it. Um, and, and one, yours is very UK-specific, which is, which is important because it's a different construct it's different culture, it's different context. And yeah, I don't know really where I'm going with that. Other, <laughs> other than just just yeah, just be like the old punks. Don't instead of picking up a guitar, pick up a plant Do and draw yourself. it. Get your bum in the hedge. And just go for it, yeah? No yeah. permission required. You just do it. If you want to do it, you just do it. Yeah. Just don't put a pint in your mouth that you don't know, you know, whether it's poisonous food or what. I'll tell you a story about that. <laughs> <laughs> I put a lot of plants in my mouth that I don't know because I am reckless. Um, I was much more reckless in my younger days and so was Fiona. I know she's put this plant in her mouth. I went for a walk in the woods. I was out in the woods on my own and there was an arum lily. So uh, I thought, oh, I've never eaten arum lily. I've never eaten you and there's something about you that I want to try. <laughs> so I bit, I tore a bit of leaf and I bit a bit and suddenly there was an explosion of battery acid on my tongue. It was the most intense experience and I was crying thinking, oh, now I've done it, my tongue's going to swell up and I'm going to die in the woods. And it probably went on for 15, 20 minutes and I've never eaten arum lily again, and I've stopped putting plants in my mouth that, well, no, I haven't really, but I have to take less bites from... But that's, <laughs> that's you knowing what the arum lily was when I did that. I'd read a botany book and was like, oh, wild ginger, we have that in this country. No way. This was many, many years ago, and I picked a leaf and put my tongue to it and had the same battery acid <laughs> explosion. It was like... Oh, not wild ginger then. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. And that was Aram. That was Aram Lily. They were yeah. the same. Yeah. And coincidentally, <laughs> I, and this has not been set up, when I was at school, age 15, having a crafty cigarette in the woods, because I lived and grew up and went to school in the woods, I thought, oh, really big wild garlic leaf, ramsons. <laughs> Picked it, bit it, blooming hell. <laughs> I was ill though because I swallowed juice and I was just in the corner of, a, of the school because, honest, to get caught smoking was worse than death punishment. <laughs> and yeah, never again. So yeah, never the, again. The, 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 the message from these three very <laughs> unique stories is don't be stupid like we were and stick a plant you can't, don't know, whether it's no. edible or medicinal. In fact, any plant you don't know its properties of ever in your mouth unless you can identify it 100% and you know what it is. That's it. Right, so to wrap and pack, where would you like people to get your book from? We're really happy for people to get our book from wherever they can. We really want people to go to their local libraries and ask the library to stock the Sensory Herbal Handbook because we'd like the information to be out there for everyone. The book costs £17 to buy direct from us and it costs £11 to buy on Amazon. <laughs> Amazon are a wonderful company, as are I'm they? sure you all know. <laughs> they pay great amounts of taxes and support our NHS. This is, this is at production. It costs every week they seem to change the price on it. But, but on our website, sensorysolutions.co.uk, we also have a blog 
with loads and loads of lovely information about plants we produce a newsletter that's got recipes links to other people doing cool work and we sell our book on there too but actually what's really good for us is if wherever you can you can log on and leave reviews about it um, if you enjoy it because that just gets it out there even more and all of the profits from anything that we do go back into our social enterprise And the main aims are about connecting people with plants and nature. So it's all for a good cause. (laughs) (laughs) Not that we're not a good cause. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Fiona Karen, Karen Fiona, really great to interview again. As always, really fun. Thanks for doing it. And we'll see you again. Lots of love. (laughs) Lots of love to you. Thank you all.